In February 2011, Christchurch was hit by a devastating earthquake that claimed the lives of 185 people. That same year, 51 people took their own lives in Canterbury. Over the next six years, that number grew steadily until 2017 when it hit 82, a 46% increase, the most of any region in New Zealand. As suicide prevention agencies scrambled for answers, most came to the conclusion that the rise was likely due to the effects of the 2011 earthquake. This seemed to make sense. It was a traumatic experience for Christchurch and no one really knew what the long-term consequences of an earthquake were. As a result, the majority of resourcing focused on combating the outcomes of the earthquake. All very logical, until you look at the data. In 2010, one year before the Christchurch earthquake, Canterbury had 78 suicides, 40% more than in 2011, and the most of any region in New Zealand. One might suggest that the 2011 earthquake caused a drop in numbers by uniting a broken city and giving them a sense of purpose. But that's a discussion for another time. The point I'm making is this. You can't fix a problem until you know what the problem is. And if the problem isn't what you thought it was, and there's an option you hadn't considered, you have to have the courage to explore it. When it comes to problems in this country, we seem to focus on recent events or behavior looking for quick answers and quick fixes. It's reactive rather than proactive. But if we want to find long-term solutions, instead of focusing on behavior, we need to start looking at what drives the behavior. For example, there's a drug problem and we all go, lock all the dealers up in jail, lock all the dealers up in jail. But for every dealer you lock up in jail, there are a hundred more to take their place. Instead of focusing on the dealers, shouldn't we be asking why are so many kids turning to drugs and what are they running from? When you can answer that question and offer up a solution, it won't matter how many dealers you have if no one wants the drugs. Same with bullying. New Zealand has one of the highest rates of bullying in the OECD. And our strategy to deal with this is Let's bully the bully, isolate the bully, humiliate the bully. You're a bad person. You need to change your behavior. Instead of focusing on the behavior, shouldn't we be asking, why do bullies bully? And the answer is simple. Bullies bully because they're being bullied. Behind every little bully in our schools, there's a bigger bully in that kid's life showing them that that's what love looks like. And there's nothing you can do or say to these kids that hasn't been done already. What we need to do collectively, whether you're a parent or not, is take these kids under our wing and show them what love really looks like. Because once you show a kid what love really looks like, and more importantly, empower them to recognize that their behavior is not love, then maybe, just maybe, it'll lead to positive change. Suicide. When someone takes their own life, the first question we ask is, what happened? Was it a job loss? A relationship breakup? Did they lose someone they love? And inevitably, we land on something from the recent past, which becomes the aha moment before going back to our busy, busy lives. But when you only focus on the last chapter of the book, inevitably, you end up missing 90% of the story. In 2020, we undertook a study of letters left behind by people who died by suicide. The letters were voluntarily submitted by those affected by the suicide, and the research was carried out by two members of the Research Association of New Zealand. In other words, it wasn't me. It was legit. We look to identify common themes and find practical answers as to why so many Kiwis are taking their own lives. And we were hoping that this research would be used to better inform future interventions. You know, be proactive instead of reactive. What we discovered was a direct contrast from the current narrative pushed by the Ministry of Health that says suicide is an impulsive act and anyone really wants to take their own lives, there's nothing much you can do. It's kind of a get out of jail free card. You know, when the numbers come down, hey guys, we're doing really well. Sure, we can improve, but we're on the right track. And when they go up, wow, 
there's nothing really you can do. You know, if someone wants to take their own lives, we've just got to try harder. But our research showed that impulsive suicides were the exception, not the norm. And most writers describe months, years, even decades of issues that contributed to their final decision, even if that decision seems sudden to the people who love them. We found that love wasn't enough. Writers knew they were loved, and they loved back. And often that love became an additional source of guilt. Many felt that they were a burden and loved ones would be better off without them. And we also found that writers did not want to die. You heard me right. They didn't want to die. They just needed the pain to end. Sadly, the people who have the power to change the narrative and try new interventions refuse to even read the report for reasons only known to themselves. If we truly want to find answers to big problems, we first have to know what the problem is. And if the problem isn't what you thought it was, you have to have the courage to explore new options. I'm Mike King for The Common Room. To see more videos like this, subscribe at commonroomnz.com.